Hello and welcome to our third monthly presentation with the Living Memory Association. Today, through photographs and memories, we take a trip back to some stunning fashion photos and we remember an iconic and revolutionary fashion designer, Mary Quant. When we say the one, we often think of memories of marriage or of love. While that is a topic which we will surely feature one day, the one we mean to talk about today is fashion related. That one piece of clothing that you just had to have. Did you ever save up for ages to buy a special outfit or coat or pair of shoes? Do you still have that precious item wrapped in muslin and tucked away in a safe corner of the attic? Or maybe you've passed it down to a son or daughter. Or perhaps you're the recipient of such a treasure from an aunt, uncle, grandparent or parent. Today, through memories and photographs, we will remember some of those special outfits. And we begin with a trip to the museum and some very special fashion pieces from the 1960s style pioneer and mod queen, Mary Quant. A few months ago, when it was safe to do so, some of us from the Wee Museum of Memories took a trip to Dundee, home to Scotland's own v &A Museum to see the extraordinary exhibition of iconic and revolutionary fashion designer Mary Quant, featuring dozens of her original designs. One of the most striking things about the exhibition was that, rather than archive museum pieces or designer collections, many of the pieces were donations from members of the public. Yes, these perfectly preserved dresses, skirt suits and raincoats had come from closets and attics across the country where those cherished pieces had been carefully preserved some for over 70 years. These photographs were taken by one of our volunteers and show a stunning piece called the Coal Heaver, which was donated by a member of the public named Elizabeth Gibbons. Here is another image of the Mary Quant exhibition. The bright yellow coat and cape was donated by a member of the public, Patricia Jones. Remarkably, some donors had even kept hold of the vibrant, psychedelia-inspired carrier bags which are seen here in front of the cape. And these were illustrated by designer and stationer Nigel Quinney. The white plastic carrier bag with the name of Mary Quant's new Bond Street shop bazaar on it was given to the v &A exhibition by Lynn Gilbert. When asked to define her style, Mary Quant responded, I suppose the Quant look is simple, sexy and chic. This smashing photo of these two young women in conversation at Gracemont Community Center was taken in 1968. The photo was an anonymous donation, so we can't be sure that they are wearing Mary Quant, but their look is certainly simple, sexy and chic, and with the fashionable pixie haircuts to boot. Like all visionary designers, elements of Quant's ideas were widely imitated and incorporated into everyday fashion. Gracemont Community Center, where this photo was taken, was opened in 1964 in what had been a mansion house and was a popular venue for youth social events. This photograph of five young people on holiday at Bond Skeed House in July 1968 was taken by Ronnie Dunbar, whose photographs feature frequently in exhibitions at the Wee Museum of Memories and in our social media, videos and posts. The three young women in the photo Janet Croft, Jennifer Hunt, and Valerie Rogers are all wearing clothes that might have been inspired by Mary Quant's design ideas. While she sold her main fashion line in high-end boutiques under her own name, her more affordable Ginger Group line could be found in department stores. Though still expensive, these were more affordable for young people, and all across the country, people saved up to buy her tights, makeup, and daisy dolls. Mary Quant was one of the first to make high-quality designer fashion more widely accessible. According to the Herald, there were shops in Scotland where the signature Mary Quant lines were stocked, and later the Ginger Group. In Edinburgh, hipsters could head along to Darling's or, going into the 1970s, John Lewis's. House of Fraser stocked the Ginger Group from its launch in 1963, and they might have stocked Mary Quant before that. The photo here is of sisters Heather and Margaret Klein and is another photo by Ronnie Dunbar taken during the same holiday at Bonskeet House in the summer of 1968. 
There's more than a little of the Mary Quant style and the twiggy pose and these young women's confident gaze at the photographer. Mary Quant is almost as well remembered for her patterns as for her own pieces. Quant sewing patterns by Buttrick and knitting patterns by Cortel enabled people to create their own piece of designer fashion at home, but with fabrics, colors, and patterns of their own choosing. The simple shapes of Quant's designs were perfect for home dressmakers to copy. For many young people who couldn't afford the six guineas or so that a Quant designer piece would cost, making their own Mary Quant was an affordable, unfun option. Denise Carroll, a Scottish visitor to the v a Dundee exhibition, remembers, I had a pattern that I made for a wedding. It got shortened several times until my grandfather asked if it was a shirt. It was about 30 centimeters below my waist, but I did wear tights under it. The photograph we see here is of trendy newlyweds Robert and Helen Jeffrey, taken on their wedding day, wearing just what you would expect of a fashionable late 1960s wedding, though Helen's skirt is a bit longer than Mary Quaint's famous ultimate minis. Of course, it was not all mini skirts in the 1960s. Mary Quant and the fashion she inspired was all about equality and comfort, as we see in this charming photograph donated by Norma Main Coleman. She is the young woman in the photo and is posing with a daffodil and reading Plato, wearing her favorite outfit, a matching pale blue denim jacket and trouser suit. She shared an era relevant memory of that day. She said, this photo was taken during typical exam weather, when it was too nice to stay indoors to study. We used to sit on the grass reading and deluding ourselves that we were working as hard as we would have been in the university library. It was the time of poetry, flower power, and beautiful people, and I couldn't resist trying to get in on the act. I loved my denim trouser suit and felt really trendy in it. Here's another double denim look from the late 1960s. One more from the collection of photographs by Edinburgh photographer Ronnie Dunbar. The woman is Phyllis Wilson, and here we see her sitting in her bedroom, an androgynously dressed very much like her idol in the poster behind her, who also wears a dark denim shirt with faded denim trousers. Do you recognize the man in the photo? Was he an actor or a singer? Or perhaps a model posing in a fashion advert? Or maybe you recognize one of the other photos. If you know who these might be, please do get in touch through our social media platforms or let us know in the comments section below the video. Here we see another photo of Phyllis Wilson in the same bedroom, but a different corner. And here with what looked like record sleeves or magazine photos decorating the balls. The two on the bottom row are, of course, the Beatles, but can you recognize the others? The bright aqua blue color and Peter Pan color of the dress that Phyllis is wearing were style details that frequently featured in and were made popular by Mary Quant designs and which were widely copied in the late 1960s. And here's another lovely young woman posing stylishly in her bedroom surrounded by bohemian posters and concert flyers. This photograph is of Mitzi Maureen Lee and was given by her daughter Abigail Lee. She remembers. My mother had moved to London to study nursing and loved the London fashion and lifestyle, especially the shops on Carnaby Street. Of course, those fashions were far too expensive for a student, so she mostly shopped at open air markets like Camden, where she bought this stunning cape. She told us how much she loved this cape and that she wore it constantly, even through the warmer summer months. Unfortunately, it never lasted long enough for any of her three daughters to inherit. She lost it on a train somewhere in Scotland, where she and my father had gone for their honeymoon. And one more photo of a teenager's bedroom. But here, a happier story of fashion that lasted. This photo, taken in the early 1980s, shows 22-year-old Michael Whitfield wearing a pair of vivid green loon pants that had been worn by his mother, Evelyn Whitfield, over 20 years before. Proof that if you hold on to your cherished piece long enough, it will come back in style. This photograph reminds us of a memory from one of our own volunteers at Thelma. Evelyn Whitfield tells us about an unusual heirloom 
a pair of aubergine colored loom trousers, or bell bottoms as you might call them. Evelyn says, I had a pair of crushed velvet aubergine colored loom pants, and I thought I was the bee's knees in those. As the years rolled on, I'm not so good at throwing things away, and those loom pants ended up in the attic. And when, and when my own family was in their 20s, we had a clean out of the attic and they appeared. And my son, who would have been about 22, he tried them on, but they were too short. So my daughter-in-law said, they would fit me. So she tried them on and they were perfect on her. So she took them over. That was about 25 years from their first wearing. Unfortunately, a photo of the famous Whitfield family aubergine colored loon trousers has not surfaced. So instead, we have a photo of Brian Saunders donated by his mother Margaret and taken in the back garden of a friend's Edinburgh home. No matter how special your treasured outfit is, there's always the dreaded chance that someone else may be wearing it, as this memory from Norma Ann Coleman shows. Norma says, Like many young people of my generation, I was the first in my family to go to university, and it was a proud day for us all when I graduated. My mother looked very smart with a fashionable dress and coat bought in a rather upmarket shop in Ayr. When she took her seat in the hall prior to the graduation ceremony, she was horrified to find that the lady sitting next to her was wearing an identical outfit. We must have exquisite taste, they both muttered with clenched teeth. Note that both my mother and my sister are wearing white gloves in the photo. A lady never went anywhere without her gloves. And here is a real treat. This photo shows Netta Percy as a bridesmaid for a 1960s wedding. Despite the influence of the London mod scene and designers like Mary Quant, and even while shorter styles were becoming popular, tradition still dominated for many weddings, and both brides and bridesmaids often opted for long, column-like dresses in lake, silk, or taffeta. For bridesmaids, wearing a colorful dress was the trend, with pastel pinks, blues, and yellows, especially in style in the early 1960s. Netta wore this dress for another special occasion, to the Royal Highland Ball in George Street when she was a member of the Highland Dancing Team. And the dress lives on. It can now be seen in our own wee museum of memories at Ocean Terminal in Leith. This picture of the dress today shows the lovely pastel pink color. And here's another museum worthy piece. This photo of Evelyn Seam wearing a white fur coat in the garden of her home. She remembers, I felt heir to the white fur coat when I was about 16 in 1960. I think an auntie passed it on to me. I thought I looked the bee's knees in it, though I only wore it a few times. I suspect it is real fur. It has a silky lining and it's hard to tell without unpicking that. And I perhaps did not realize the significance of that at the time. It has been in my attic since we moved to the house in 1970. I offered it to a drama group, but they were currently short of storage space, so it was consigned back to the attic. And here's a photograph of the, the white fur coat as it is today. And one more photo and story of a heritage piece from Evelyn. She says, My family were around this Sunday for Mother's Day and were having fun poring over the old photo albums that I still have scattered about the sitting room. They found this lovely photo of me in my red poncho at Aviemore at Easter 1971 with my one-year-old son Michael. And here is a photograph of my 22-year-old granddaughter Catherine wearing the very same red poncho and holding her baby, Jesse. We leave you with one last photo from Ronnie Dunbar of the group of stylish young people departing at the end of their iconic holiday at Bronskid House, the YMCA, in July 1968. Do you have any memories of favorite dresses or cherished family fashion heirlooms? Or perhaps you have a photo of you or a family member wearing a Mary Quant designer piece? or maybe even the piece. If so, please let us know by writing in the comments below or sharing your memories, discoveries, and photographs on our social media pages. Thank you for your visit today.